Before we get into the actual equation of energy being emitted by accelerated charges, let us discuss a bit of background to set the scene. In 1864, Scottish physicist James Maxwell was able to put together a set of equations which would be the cornerstone of electromagnetic theory. These were the Maxwell's equations. Through these equations, he predicted that coupled electric and magnetic fields could travel through space as an electromagnetic wave at a speed that was previously calculated as the speed of light, and he therefore proposed that these waves constituted nothing but light itself. The actual proof of his theory, however, came in 1887 by German physicist Heinrich Hertz. Hertz noted tiny sparks jumping from a charging induction coil to another coil that seemed to indicate the presence of electromagnetic waves. He therefore created a simple apparatus including a transmitter and a receiver. At a specific distance, he was able to observe that sparks started to jump from the transmitter to the receiver, which can only be accounted for by traveling electromagnetic waves. This was a huge breakthrough, but this experiment, along with Maxwell's equations, still raised the question, how are these waves produced? Consider an electric charge that is moving at a constant speed. The electric field is shown. It is described by the electric field equation, where u is the velocity at which electromagnetic information travels to the field position, and v is the velocity of the moving charge. When the charge is not moving, v becomes zero, and the equation reduces to the familiar electrostatic field equation given by Coulomb's law. The electric field can also be represented by each potential lines for better visualization. If a particle, initially at rest, suddenly accelerates for a specific time, we see that the field lines before and after acceleration are no longer aligned. But we cannot have any breaks in the electric field lines, so a kink is formed. As the field moves outwards, the kink moves along with it at the speed of light. As we put in more field lines, we can observe the disturbance move more clearly. This disturbance in the field, as the charge accelerates, therefore constitute the radiation produced. The equation for the electric field therefore includes a term for the acceleration and a term for the velocity. It can also be visualized in three dimensions where the radiated field due to the accelerated charge forms a spherical surface. Let us now find an expression for the rate at which the energy is being radiated by the charge. We first consider the pointing vector, which is the directional energy flux, or in other words, the energy transfer per unit area per unit time. Since the pointing vector represents a flux, we can directly find out the total rate of energy being radiated in all directions by simply integrating it throughout the entire surface. But first, let us substitute the known values and simplify it as best we can. Since the magnetic field can be produced from a changing electric field, we can substitute the value of B as follows. And using the rule for vector triple products, we can simplify it to the following terms. As stated before, the electric field constitutes a term for the velocity field and a term for the acceleration field. But the velocity field does not contribute to the energy that is being radiated. The radiated field is therefore given with just the acceleration field term. From this equation, it is apparent that the field and the direction of propagation are perpendicular. Therefore, the second term of the pointing vector becomes zero, and the first term remains. Directly substituting this term would make the equation a lot more troublesome to deal with, so we make an assumption. We assume that the charge suddenly stops after a certain time period, such that when it comes to rest, u does not involve the velocity of the charge. 
The equation therefore changes. Substituting the relation between the permeability, permittivity, and the speed of light, we can rewrite the equation as follows. We can now substitute the field equation into the pointing vector. Seeing the value of the dot product between A and trace of R, and using the relation between sines and cosines, we finally get a simpler form of the pointing vector. When plotted in three dimensions, we get the shape of a donut about the direction of instantaneous acceleration, which implies that no power is radiated in the forward and backwards direction. Finally, let us now calculate the actual power that is being radiated by the accelerating charge. We integrate the pointing vector throughout the surface area, and using spherical polar coordinates, we get the Lamar formula for power being radiated from an accelerating charge. It can be noted from the equation that the power is directly proportional to the square of the acceleration. This led to several implications, one of which is a drawback of the movement of a classical electron in Bohr's model of an atom. An electron which moves in a circular orbit keeps on accelerating, and by Larmer's power formula, it should consequently lose energy in the form of radiation and fall towards the nucleus. However, this does not occur in reality. But later, modifications were made using quantum theory to account for the missing pieces. For the Larmer formula, although we have derived it with the assumption that the particle velocity is zero, it actually holds to good approximation when v is much less than c, which is the non-relativistic case. In the relativistic case, which is when the particle approaches the speed of light, the equation can be generalized by Lenard's relation, where gamma is a Lorentz factor. The factor gamma to the power 6 implies that the radiated power increases enormously as the particle velocity approaches the speed of light. This generalization, when v equals to 0, reduces to the Lamar formula as expected.